Okay, so welcome to OMS, everyone. Our first speaker is Alexi Bobrik, uh, who is going to talk about modeling short period uh, STB binaries with MESA. Yeah. Go ahead, Alexi. Thank you so very much, Ingrid, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here talking to you, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about modeling short period subdwarf B stars uh, binaries with MESA. And uh, the presentation is based pretty much on three works uh, we've done uh, mostly with these three people. Uh, one of them being Joris Voss. He's one of the key people uh, in modeling the long period uh, subdwarf B stars. Uh, myself uh, here and uh, Maya Vukvich, uh, who is uh, here with us, who is a very important observer of stellar oscillations and dwarf um, and subdwarf stars. And um, so just to start off, let me just explain what are these subdwarf B stars um, generally. And there are really three ways to look at it. And uh, the first one is just very simple. Here's an artist's impression. So subdwarf B stars are these small blue bright stars. Uh, in this case, it's also with stellar spots. Um, a more kind of everyday like uh, as, as astronomical observational perspective on that is that subdwarf B stars are stars of spectral class B. So it's another word of saying that they're blue. And uh, they're also subdwarfs, meaning that they lie on the HR diagram uh, below the main sequence stars, which are called dwarfs. So they're subdwarfs. Um, in other words, they're dimmer than main sequence stars. And uh, from their location on the HR diagram, one could infer that they're helium burning stars. And uh, from their spectra, one can confirm that they're hydrogen poor. So they have very small amount of hydrogen. And uh, it is not very typical for stars to have that configuration because stars initially start as a mixture of helium and hydrogen. But in this case, it's mostly helium burning and there's very little hydrogen on top of that. And uh, typically, subdwarf B stars have radii of about 0.1 solar radii. They're quite small. And they have masses usually in the range between 0.4 and 0.48 solar masses. And uh, I should add that because they're helium burning, they're relatively short lived. They live only for 100 mega years, and that's relatively short on the uh, time scales of, for example, galaxy evolution. Um, another way to look at subdwarf B stars uh, is by thinking how they can form. So subdwarf B stars can form in the following way. Just think about evolution of a single star like the sun. So uh, schematically here, so main sequence star like the sun initially burns hydrogen in its center, when the hydrogen is burned, the core contracts and becomes degenerate, and then the star becomes a ray giant. Over time, the ray giant core grows in size and mass, and the ray giant envelope also grows in size. And uh, by the end of the ray giant stage, the envelope is relatively big, and then the core ignites helium through a helium flash, and the star turns into a horizontal branch star, in which case we have a core which is burning helium right now, and it's surrounded by a hydrogen envelope, hydrogen and helium envelope. Uh, around it. And so a way to make a subdwarf B star is to somehow repeat the scenario, but somehow remove this envelope of red giants so that only the core remains. So in other words, subdwarf B stars are essentially the same as horizontal branch stars. So the same stars burning here in the center, but without the envelope. So something has to take the envelope to make a subdwarf B star. Um, and in real life, the evolutionary scenario for that looks like that. So what can take the envelope is a binary companion. So uh, here I'll be focusing mostly on subdwarf B stars with primary masses or uh, from progenitors up to two solar masses. So these stars ignite helium degeneratively as opposed to, to more massive stars which ignite helium non-degeneratively. And uh, these are most typical, most common, most common subdwarf B stars. So if a main sequence star like this uh, between 0.7 and two solar masses uh, evolves to become a red giant, and has a companion at a separation of about 100 to 800 days, and then the primary can evolve into real, relatively developed red giant, so therefore it can grow rel re relatively reasonable core size, and then um, it means that close to the end of red giant branch, it starts mass transfer to the companion. And then as it transfers mass, the companion can strip the material from the red giant or take away the material from the red giant. And then after that, the core of the red giant can become, can ignite helium and become a subdwarf B star. And at this point, there are two possibilities. So one possibility is if the red giant had not two different mass from the companion, so if its mass did not exceed the companion mass by more than a factor of two, then what? The, then the mass transfer would be proceeding in a stable fashion. So in other words, the red giant would transfer mass and the final orbit would have comparable size and period to the orbit of the initial binary. So this stable fashion scenario or outcome leads to the formation of long periods of B binaries 
And uh, these long periods of Warby binaries are again made, of course, of ray giants, which have ignited helium and companions on orbits between 500 and 1500 days. Uh, in the other case, so if the ray giant had mass much larger than the mass of the companion, more than by a factor of two, for example, it was a low mass companion, uh, the binary would go through a common envelope phase wherein the companion would spiral in through the envelope of the ray giant and help unbind that envelope. And as a result, we would have a binary, which is a core of the red giant, which has ignited helium, the sub B star, and the companion on a very tight orbit of between hour and few days. So these binaries, sub B binaries, are called short periods of B binaries. And uh, uh, these are two main types of sub B binaries. There's a third one, which is called single sub B binaries, and they come from a totally different scenario where two white dwarfs merge and ignite helium, two helium white dwarfs merge. Um, so I have tried to summarize the useful applications of subdorb B stars. They come here on the left. I'll quickly go through through them just uh, just to really just so that people can appreciate the field. So subdorb B stars are very good for probing red giants because we basically essentially have the information about red giant when it is very developed, uh, pretty much in the scenario. Subdorb B stars are relatively bright compared to, for example, white dwarfs. And if they have main sequence companion, which is sufficiently massive, they can be observed as double line binaries, which means that these binaries can, um, well, allow us to characterize their orbits quite well. Uh, quite very importantly, I believe, is that they have quite a simple formation scenario. They just have one mass transfer phase that leads to these binaries. So unlike, for example, double white dwarfs, or for example, like double neutron stars, which have many mass transfer phases. Um, Subdor B stars pretty well probe mass loss, and that is because the conditions for their formation are pretty very unique. So one has to not only lose the envelope, but one has to also ignite the core. So in these two conditions make the formations, formation of subdor B binaries quite a rare event, and that makes allows us to quite well characterize what was the red giant before, which led to the formation of these binaries. Then uh, subdor B binaries have been recently formed. Uh, shown to, uh, to constrain the time scales of common envelope events. Uh, Subdor B binaries uh, are actually reflecting the galactic chemical evolution in history, which I'll mention in a little bit more detail further. Uh, Subdor B binaries on short periods are important LISA sources of gravitational waves, apparently. So they are actually second most important source of gravitational waves for LISA community. And uh, Subdor B binaries, at least with white dwarf companion, are important type of supernova progenitors. And uh, finally, uh, what I'm going to be talking about quite a lot is that Subdor B binaries on short periods are also uh, good probes of common envelope parameters um, in, in, in binary evolution. Um, so let me just um, talk a bit about the long periods of the B stars. Uh, long periods of the B stars result from stable mass transfer. I remind you that this is a branch when the regent had mass not much exceeding the companion mass. Uh, currently, we observe about 25 uh, sub long periods of the B binaries with main sequence companions. And these binaries have measured orbital periods and mass ratios. And uh, here is a diagram of mass ratios versus periods. And uh, I just should mention that until recently, the exact location of observed systems on these diagrams was not really well explained. And uh, what has helped us explain that uh, observed, lo observed locations of uh, long periods of the binaries on mass ratio orbital period plane was the galactic chemical evolution. So uh, the idea there is relatively simple. So see, subdor B stars live for a short time, 100 mega years. So that means that they have formed, the ones we see today have formed recently, uh, astrophysically. And then, for example, if, if a subdor B star comes from a star like the sun of one solar mass, then one solar mass star takes about 10 billion years to evolve to become a red giant. It means that if you look at a subdor B star from a one solar mass star, that star has formed 10 million years ago. But then we also know that 10 million years ago, the galactic metallicity was different from the present day metallicity. In fact, metallicity was about minus 0 0.4. And um, if you don't account for that, we apparently do not uh, model the regions quite accurately. So in fact, the regions from the early galaxy and regions at solar metallicity have their peak radii by about 30% different from each other. And that is because if you have more metals in the envelope, the metals make the envelope more opaque, and that leads to larger convection, and regions become larger at high metallicities. And then when regions become larger, if the regions are larger, then the mass transfer in these binaries happens at different initial periods, and as a, as a result, we get different final orbital properties for some Dorby stars. And uh, on this diagram, I just show how the mass of the progenitor star is related to metallicity. And here, for example, we see that indeed the bunsel mass ray giants, which 
one solar mass stars which become red giants today indeed were born at quite low middle east is about minus 0.4 whereas two solar mass stars which live only for one billion years were formed relatively recently and they have middle east comparable to that of the sun so what we have done in that study we have basically simulated a set of subdual B progenitors with the detailed cell structure evolution code MESA. Uh, so we have uh, set up a population uh, following the galactic Middle East history. It's actually a really very simple setup. So it's uh, there are very well defined canonical models of how Middle East was changing in the galaxy, and it's very well accepted. And uh, we have put that into MESA, and we have simulated through the progenitors of solar V stars. And then also we have modeled which of these MESA simulated binaries would be observed as subdor B binaries, composite subdor B binaries. Uh, in other words, we have reproduced the observational criteria applied to identifying or uh, checking the candidates for identifying the subdor B stars. And uh, essentially, just the key point is that actually, if we do account for metallicity, we do explain the period mass ratio relation pretty well. So uh, here on the plot on the bottom left, we have the Observed systems, uh, which are in squares, the modeled systems, which are blue circles, uh, period versus mass ratio. And in this case, we set up basically the galactic metallicity evolutionary history. And uh, we find that the, the, the models quite well sit on top of observations. Uh, if instead we initialized our population with just solar metallicity, as was done quite commonly before, we see that the models do not quite well, sorry, fit on the observations. And uh, if we, for example, set up metallicity like equal to minus one, or for example, uniform as also has been done in previous models, we also see that we cannot quite well explain the observations. And uh, I should mention that these observations were explained without any explicit parameter tuning. So actually we use the most standard canonical model of mass transfer in binaries, and we have used the most standard canonical model of uh, galactic chemical evolution. And we found that the observations are explained pretty well. And then just to really check that we did the good job, we have taken the uh, models and we have taken the observational data about the metallicities and periods. So we just really wanted to check that really metallicities play a role in these, uh, in these binaries. So we took the same simulations. We took the same, you know, really evolutionary tracks, the same outcomes, uh, and uh, plotted the final orbital period versus metallicity, and then took the observations and then also use the observed values of metallicity of the companion stars in the SDB binaries. And we found that actually the simulations lie on top of the models really well. I mean, and we just we just literally use the same models, the same simulations which we used before. And uh, with that, we felt that perhaps maybe we understand the observed population fairly well because we are able to explain the long period binaries, mass ratios, metallicities, and periods quite well. And uh, also just overall number counts in the nearest 500 or one kiloparsec sample also quite well. And uh, with this, we thought that perhaps, well, maybe we could apply the same model or the same sort of ideas uh, to model the short period population. So the short period population, I remind you, comes when the red giant transfers mass to the main sequence star and the whole thing goes through the common envelope phase and the red giant core nevertheless ignites helium and becomes a subdor V star. Um, so right now, if you think about the, um, observational set of short periods of door B stars, uh, we are working with uh, observations of uh, approximately 80 systems, and uh, they are made of three subsets, uh, specifically the radial velocity sample of binaries which are identif identified spectroscopically and for which we have radial velocities, uh, the eclipsing systems for which we have not only periods, but also we have uh, more detailed parameters like log Gs and others, and also photometric variables, which uh, in which we can also infer periods from their photometric variability. So in particular, from the observed set, for example, we have distributions of periods and log Gs for a subset of these systems. And then we can try to see if we can explain these with, uh, with, the, uh, with the models. Uh, now, one thing about modeling this population is that there is a quite important element in the scenario, which is called common envelope phase. Uh, so in this phase, the companion spirals into the envelope of a red giant, and actually here are images from the simulations of uh, red giant, um, a developed red giant interacting with the brown dwarf, thus producing a subdwarf B star with the brown dwarf companion by Michael Kramer from last year. And uh, the difficulty of modeling this common envelope phase, at least uh, in, in mesostellar evolution, is that common envelope phase is intrinsically three-dimensional. It's hard to mod model it. And on top of that, the common envelope phase is not modeled inside mesostellar vision code. So there's no like thing, no, no routine, nor model for going through the common envelope phase in MESA. 
And uh, once one, well, there, there, there are models of common envelope, there are common envelope prescriptions, but still, even if we apply those prescriptions, we still can't answer these questions straight away. So for example, we, we don't know exactly what will be, uh, so whether the core of the giant will ignite or not, because we just have to apply the prescription from like from outside, uh, not from ESA. Uh, we also don't know whether the, uh, what, what will be the amount of hydrogen envelope left on the on the star after we apply the common prescription. And finally, we don't know exactly the final orbit straight away because that's subject to uncertainties. So essentially, in, in order to arrive at short period SDB binaries, we have to do three things really. So first of all, uh, do the evolution of the binaries until they start common envelope phase then go or evolve them through common envelope phase. Uh, we do that through the prescription by uh, Krukov, wherein we really peel the star layer by layer and change its orbit. And then one needs to have a model for the donor remnant. And that is something we have to model without MESA again, because MESA does not do the common envelope evolution. And uh, I will talk about how we do that uh, very shortly. So uh, the key parameters for this model really are these three. So first of all, when does the common envelope evolution start? So for example, does it start at this mass transfer rate or this condition or some other condition? Uh, secondly, there are the so-called common envelope parameters. In other words, it basically says how efficient is the binary at unbinding the envelope as it spirals in to the envelope of another star. And finally, there is a third parameter which is called the angular momentum loss of the binary which precedes the common envelope evolution. That's something which parameterizes the um, interaction in the binary before the common envelope phase starts. Um, so to model what happens to the remnant, we have used this so-called neural network assisted population synthesis code, which is called NAPS. Uh, NAPS is a code which is developed by Joris Voss and uh, which we uh, basically apply in the following way. So NAPS as a code uh, is based on deep neural networks and uh, it allows us to interpolate effectively in n dimensions. So for example, here's an example of our long period study and, so, uh, and, and, and on the right hand side, uh, we have taken the results of the study, the measurements on the left, and we have interpolated between the results of measurements on the right. So in other words, uh, we have run approximately 1,000 models in MESA. We have produced the absorbed uh, periods and mass ratios of subdor B stars. Then we have interpolated between them with the NAPS code, and then the NAPS code for a million models predicted the final periods and mass ratios of the binaries, and we get this kind of nice distribution over here. So one could think of this NAPS code as a way to interpolate between MESA outputs effectively. And uh, it basically can save us time because we can do that in seconds instead of days, because taking one MESA run takes about a day and uh, the NAPS takes about a second. And uh, effectively, it somehow would maybe thought of as some kind of like a part of a pop synthesis code. And uh, by the way, I should mention that NAPS can interpolate general uh, inputs and outputs. So NAPS is quite very general. And secondly, NAPS is public. So you can actually find NAPS on GitHub and uh, even contribute to its development. So please be welcome. Uh, I'll, I'll have that link in my last slide so you can actually later on copy it if you like. Um, so we, what we have done in the short period um, study, so we have just very quickly, um, the study is made uh, in two parts really. So one part is really training. So in this case, we have initialized the galactic population uh, of the binaries progenitors. We have evolved them through MESA after the common envelope phase. Uh, we have selected the uh, binaries which, uh, well, which will be absorbed as long period systems because we can model them and we can produce them pretty well. Then we have used the long period systems to train NAPS to identify whether cores of red giants will ignite helium or not and how will these cores look like. So in other words, uh, we have trained NAPS to say that for given initial parameters, will this core eventually ignite helium? What will be the core and envelope mass after helium ignition? And what will be its effective temperature and log g? So uh, we have found that if we take a red giant, which is stripped of, of the envelope, and if we just put as input variables, the initial mass of the star, the iron over H, the final mass of the core after the red giant mass lost its envelope, and the, um, and, and the final mass of the whole thing, core plus envelope, after red giant has lost its envelope, then these four parameters, which are obtainable through common envelope prescription, can predict whether the core will ignite helium or not with an accuracy of 99.3%. So actually it's very pretty much accurate. So in other words, so if you take the uh, models for long period uh, binaries with NAPS, we can say whether helium is ignited or not and can test it against MESA. 
If we take short period binaries, we cannot test it with the guest method because course and uh, all the stars are in initially the same parameter space or initial same parameter region. We can say whether they will ignite helium or not, and then we can predict their appearance. Um, so the second half of the study was really about predicting the appearance of binaries. So we, we basically varied all the different common envelope parameters. And uh, we have also, uh, with that, predicted what are possible populations of short periods of dwarf B stars with uh, Macy's companions, long periods of dwarf B stars, and uh, also sub short period stars with subdwarf A and horizontal branch stars and main sequence companions. And then by looking at these three populations at the same time, we have been able to constrain the communal parameters by observations. So here's an example of uh, best fitting uh, models uh, on the plot. There's final period versus uh, the final mass of the companion. And uh, this, is one, uh, this is the best fitting model so far we have for the observations and it's based on uh, this value of common envelope alpha and the value for the time scale of evolution of the angle momentum, which is the condition for the onset of common envelope evolution. And in here, for example, we see that the observed uh, final masses and periods are produced reasonably uh, well. And then also the observed effective temperatures on the, on the histogram on the bottom are also reproduced reasonably well, wherein we believe that the hot stars which we do not reproduce come from our massive stars which we don't model. Um, so what we have done, the main conclusions, so we have done literally grids of different setups, like different assumptions about common envelope alpha parameter and different stability uh, condition or the different condition for the common, com common envelope onset. And we have checked how do they reproduce the observed properties. So for example, here on the grid on the top right, you can see the alpha common envelope on the, on the x-axis and the stability limit the condition at which the common, common envelope starts on the y-axis. And uh, the blue color means that it's consistent with observations of the periods of the subdorb B stars. And the red color means that it's inconsistent with observations of the periods of subdorb B stars. So for example, we see that common envelope alpha of larger than 0.5 and uh, early onset of mass transfer, for example, is inconsistent with periods of observed subdorb B stars. And uh, we do this sort of thing to different other observables and different other populations. Just here's an example of composite over a single uh, observed short periods of subdorb B stars. So in here, we count the number of the observed uh, composite systems wherein the companion has a mass um, of larger than 0.5 solar masses and uh, over observ observation of the single systems where a companion is less massive than 0.5 solar masses. And we find that uh, this particular constraint, we, like in, in observations, we don't see that many systems or don't see any systems with companions larger than 0.5 solar masses. So we think that it's a very rare system. So, in other words, we could say that the observations of um, companion masses uh, constrain the possible values of common envelope alpha and stability to again be in these regions. And then in summary, so we basically saying that uh, the common envelope onset must occur at about 10 to the minus 1.5 solar masses per year. Uh, that's a phase when the L3 mass loss becomes important. L3 mass loss is mass loss from behind the red giant uh, when mass transfer gets uh, to really high rates. Uh, we find that the alpha common envelope of 0.1 is favored for the formation of subdorb B stars. And uh, we find that this value of alpha common envelope is quite close to the alpha common envelope, which is found for the studies of wide dwarf main sequence binaries. And we think that the closeness of this value of alpha is relatively expected because in formation of wide dwarf main sequence binaries, we also have very giant transfer mass to the main sequence companion. So I actually believe that perhaps maybe value of alpha should be quite, quite comparable and that's encouraging for us. So uh, this is about it, main key takeaways. Uh, Subdwarf B stars, I just want to really convey that Subdwarf B stars are excellent probes of binary cell revolution. So Subdwarf B stars reflect the key history. Subdwarf B stars constrain mass transfer models in uh, regent mass transfer. Subdwarf B stars constrain common envelope parameters. And uh, like in this study, we have modeled on and short periods Subdwarf B stars with MESA. And uh, last but not least, there's this very useful NUPS tool which can help you run many, many, many runs of uh, well, of systems uh, which are kind of sampled in between the measurements, uh, very efficiently anyways, and it's on GitHub and uh, yeah. Thank you so very much. Thanks, Alexei. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. Maybe people are still typing, but while they are typing, Maybe can you go back to your uh, plot where you have interpolated with NAPs and you have 10 to the six models? Yes. Yeah. Uh, are the, the red dots or squares are the, the data, yes? Yes. I see that there's, there seem to be 
two different groupings and you seem to explain one well but the other not so much can you comment on that uh definitely yes so we believe that now uh, since the time when we did that study we now can explain the second uh, grouping also quite well uh the reasons for the second grouping so far seem to be not terribly interesting maybe but i don't know we might write a paper about that so I mean, but the point is that uh the sort of the, the split in the upper part and lower part and they have different progenitor scenarios and some of these systems are also not sub b stars so, i mean like uh there's, there's, there's details in that, but they're quite, oh, it's, it's not that hard to explain this uh, second branch. It's a different scenario, you think? Uh, it's not a different scenario, it's an edge of the main scenario, if you like. So uh, these are particularly old stars from thick disk, and uh, these are stars which came from more massive stars, and there's in between there are stars which are okay. yet different in origin. So, uh, so in, in principle, it's not quite hard to, <laughs> to explain that. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a hand up from uh, Monica. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question if you like. Okay, hi. I wanted to ask you if the code you're using does include a recombination energy of hydrogen when you calculate this alpha, because you show different alphas and you favor a small one, but does this include or, or is pure orbital energy? Uh, so we... <laughs> Uh, yes and no. So, I mean, specifically in the prescription from Krukov and, uh, and uh, et al. Uh, 2019, the uh, common envelope prescription is based on two alphas. One is alpha of common envelope for the orbit, and second one is for the thermal energy. And I guess the thermal energy perhaps implicitly could be connected to recombination energy, although we didn't uh, split it explicitly, but it's related to how thermal energy and recombination energy can help unbind the envelope. So, uh, so far in the default model, we have assumed that alpha uh, thermal and alpha orbital are equal to each other, but uh, one could look deeper and probably find even better insights from that, hopefully. Yeah, because you're comparing to my work from 2010, and then the 2.5, 0.2, is without any thermal mm -hmm. energy. So it's mm -hmm. pure mm -hmm. orbital energy. If you include the thermal, then it's going to be lower. So it's going to be even more similar to what you got. Oh, Monica, thank you so much for the comment. I think it's extremely relevant. Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid we have to move on. Uh, thanks again, Alexei. Thank you.